you from receiving it? Absolutely. Does the devil try to come against me for, for ministering to start with? Absolutely. Does the devil talk to me? Absolutely. If you keep preaching this, there ain't going to be five people left. This is not a message that's going to bring in hundreds of people in this church. You know that, don't you, Ron? Yep, I know that. But guess what, devil? It's the truth, and I'm going to preach the truth because God's revealing the truth. If there's nobody left but just me. Because just like Jesus, Jesus came to his own, but his own received him not. But as soon as they didn't receive him, then you know what? He said that, that Jonah is a type of me. And when Jonah was buried three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, when he came up, you know what he did? He didn't go back to the Jews. He went to the Gentiles. And though Jesus said that Jonah is a type of me. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. Well, when Jonah was raised up from the, first, the, the belly of the whale, guess where he went? He didn't go to the Jews. He went to Nineveh. The Gentiles got the gospel. Jesus came to his own first. They rejected him. So after his death, burial, and resurrection, guess what? He went back to the Jews to give them a second opportunity. But when they rejected it, he went on to the Gentiles. Paul done the same thing. He came to the church first. The church rejected it, persecuted him, beat him a little, tied him up, put him in jail, stoned him, thrown him into the deep, tried to drown him. Wonderful message. I mean, you're talking about a ministry that was really... Make you somebody was Paul's ministry. And you know, they did everything in the book to stop the message and the messenger. But Paul said, you know what? Even though you got me in shackles, now I'm bound. He said, the word of God ain't bound. And isn't it amazing how Paul wasn't all that popular until after he was killed? His message never was received except through a hand, by a handful of people until after he was dead. Then somebody, those few that believed in him, took his messages, took his letters that he wrote, some of them while he was in prison, he wrote those letters, and they began to pass them around. My God, look what Paul was talking about here. Yeah, he's dead, but boy, his message ain't, listen to that. Just look at that. <laughs> you know what I'm doing tonight? Without me even knowing it, I'm defending the gospel. I'm not defending Ron Thomas. It does not matter to me. If you like me, don't like me. If you think I'm God or the devil, that makes no, no difference to me. But I'm defending the message that God's bringing forth. I mean, I know I lay my life on the line that this message is from God, and it's not from Ron Thomas or anybody else. It's from the Lord. Are you going to go through persecution if you listen to it? Yes. You're going to be rejected and called crazy if you listen to it? Yes. But look what happened to you when God brought you out the first time. When we started following the message of Christ in you, the hope of glory, the first time. Did everybody just, I mean, praise you for doing that? Did all your family understand and they just rallied behind you? Boy, go for it. <laughs> no. Well, I got news for you and I got news for me. They're not going to do it this time either. We heard the message from the beginning. There's going to be a called out of the called out. Don't look now, but God's calling out another call out of the call out. Are we going to be persecuted? Yeah, we're not going to be persecuted the first group. We're going to be persecuted the second group. The second group that was called out is going to persecute the called out of them. That's what it always is. <laughs> it's good to be part of the those that God has brought forth and enlightened some things and all this. How many know God knows what he's doing? God knows what he's doing. You know what? I'm so glad, saints of God, that God is bringing us into the redemptive work of Christ, the message of redemption. And not only are we learning about redemption, but we're also learning that we can absolutely enjoy it right now. We don't have to wait till Jesus comes back. Isn't God good? We don't have to wait until Jesus comes back to be healed. Don't have to wait till Jesus comes back to have the victory over the devil. Jesus is not coming back to whoop the devil for you. You got that, didn't you? Whip, whoop the devil? I mean, Jesus didn't whip the devil. He whooped the devil. And he's done, done that once and for all and turned around and gave us authority and dominion over it so I don't have to run around fighting the devil, trying to whip the devil. He's already whipped. The only thing I got to do is let the devil know where he is and that he's under my feet. And that ain't one of these days that we're going to have victory over that. One of these days, 
Boy, there's going to be an angel of heaven come down and bind that old devil and cast him into the pit and be bound for a thousand years. Boy, won't it be wonderful then? Well, ain't that what the Bible says? Yes, it does. But you know what that word angel is? Look it up for yourself. It's number 32 in your strong concordance. It's not some angelic being. It's a messenger. Let me tell you something. The sons of God, the mature saints in the end time, is going to be the messenger that has authority and dominion that binds the devil like Jesus gave us authority over. We're not waiting for something. It's here now. It's here now. That upsets some religious people, but it don't bother me because they're upset. I, they just don't understand. They're still looking. They're still wandering around in the wilderness and, and climbing sand dunes and, 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 you know, and holding on till they finally get there. I got news for them. I'm already in Canaan land. I'm eating the grapes right now, and it's not raisins. Some people had a taste of grapes 40 years ago, and they've been hanging on to that pot of grapes until they ain't nothing but raisins and prunes. I got that from somebody. That, that, who was that talking about that? I thought it was good. I know some people are eating raisins and prunes in their Christian experience. I'm not eating raisins and prunes. I'm eating fruit off of the vine, fresh every day, because the Lord Jesus Christ is fruitful, and he's bringing, bringing it forth. Don't have to wait. They go to the neighbor and say, I'm tired of waiting. Y'all give up on me? <laughs> they got tired of waiting. <laughs> the thing about it is, how long are we going to wait? Look over to the neighbor and say, the waiting's over with. The waiting is over with. You know, a lot of people, a lot of people say, you know what? If this message is true that Brother Ron is teaching and we already are redeemed and the devil's already whipped, then why is it that the devil is running rampant? He's only running rampant in his own kingdom out there. And you know why he's running rampant in the kingdom out there? Because the Bible tells us, Jesus said, you're the light of the world. You're the salt that set, you're the salt of the earth. You're a city that's set on a hill that can't be hid. You know why the, the devil is running rampant? It's because the church is the salt, and we wind up in the salt shaker with a lid on it, and we can't get out. I tell you what God's getting ready to do. He's getting ready to shake some salt out in the world out there and get some salt out there and get the light out of the church and get it out in the world where the darkness is. Because, you know, the only way in the world that darkness can prevail is absent from light. And the church is wound up inside of the church and the Christians in the church cursing the darkness that's out there. Oh, boy, it's getting dark out there, ain't it? Boy, ain't it bad out there. Boy, have you heard what all the devil's doing out there? Man, I'm so glad I ain't out there. You know what the Lord is saying? Yes, the devil always runs rampant where there's no saints of God to stand up against him. Isn't that right? Satan will run rampant until the saints of God stands up and has authority and know that we have authority, say, no, nope, that's as far as you go right there. Can we do it all over the world? God's going to start with us right now and learn to have authority where you are. And then as it grows, have no authority. And our We're waiting for Jesus to come back and whip the devil, put the Antichrist down, destroy him with the brightness of his rising, and the sword that's going to come out of his mouth. Guess what? Guess what? <laughs> the Bible says in Thessalonians that he is coming to be glorified, glorified in his saints. He's coming for the brightness of his glory to be revealed in us. Guess what? The word is coming out of our mouth and not some, you know, Jesus way off. I mean, we're the body of Christ. He speaks through us today, and the Antichrist, or whatever you want to call it, is destroyed by the brightness of his coming and by the word that comes out of our mouth. It's time. How long are we going to have church? How long are we going to talk about it? How, many go, how long are we going to preach about it? How many know the Bible says, we talked about this this morning in 1 Corinthians 13, that where there be prophecies, they will fail. Isn't that right? And where there be tongues, they will cease. 
and knowledge will be done away with. Why? Because there's going to come a time, and I believe it's right now, that prophecy is fulfilled. How long are we going to keep prophesying and speaking about that which is to come? When is it going to come? It's here now. Amen. Well, if Jesus whipped the devil, then what am I fighting? I don't know. Maybe you don't know he's whipped. Maybe you're still fighting something that you don't know is already defeated. You can fight him if you want to. The Lord will let us fight him. Say, so go to it. But I'm going to be honest with you. The church has been fighting the devil for 2,000 years. Has it whipped him yet? Has the church whipped the devil yet? No. But I tell you, the ones that do have the victory over him is not those that's fighting him, but those that know that they have authority through the name of Jesus. You resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. You bind the devil, and he's bound. You lose him, and he's loose. So what the Lord is doing is putting the picture of the puzzle together, like we were talking about earlier, and everything in the Word of God must fit into the pattern. Everything in the Word of God. You know, this revelation, that revelation, I've got my revelation, you've got your revelation. Boy, this over here's got a wild revelation. Like we were talking about before, you can come up with any kind of revelation reading the Bible you want to. Amen. You can interpret the Scripture any way you want to interpret it. We can all go out and start our own church with nobody there but me, myself, and I so that we'll all believe it like me and myself and I. But him and oh, the truth of the matter is is God is speaking one message, he's got one picture, he's got one plan, and all of it's got to fit into that one plan or else my revelation ain't worth a flip. What is, the, what is the total message or what is the complete message of the Word of God? It is restoration. Amen. That's the message. It's mankind being back on the earth. The meek shall inherit what, heaven? The earth. Shall, what? The earth. the earth. The Bible tells us that Abraham was promised and his seed, they were promised to inherit the earth. And the Bible says it was not given unto them because of works or the law, but it was given, the world was given to Abraham and his seed after him by faith. Well, we know the seed of Abraham, Jesus Christ. And we know according to the Scriptures that God already said in his word that Jesus Christ, God gave everything to Jesus Christ. Does the world belong to Jesus Christ? <laughs> got, got conflicts and answers here. Does the world, I'm not talking about the system of the world, I'm talking about the earth. Does the earth belong to Jesus Christ? Is he an heir of all things? Is anything that the Father's ever created, is it out of his hands, or was all things given unto Jesus Christ? Why? Because he's Abraham's seed. And because he's Abraham's seed, saints of God, then he's the heir of all things. Guess what? We don't have to conquer and try to attain and all this. We are heirs of all things through Jesus Christ. Christ is in me. I'm in him. I'm an heir. So therefore, I'm going to quit talking about it and start enjoying it. <laughs> Y'all get your questions written down? <laughs> Well, I'll be honest with you. If I am healed, and I was healed, and you know the Bible plainly says in Second Peter, First Peter one and twenty four, three and twenty four, he tells me that he bore our sins in his own body, and by his stripes we were healed. Does the Bible not say that? Well, if I were healed and I am healed, then why ain't I healed? That's the question. You know, the saints, we question the truth of God's Word before we will question the circumstances around us that cause that a lie. Isn't that right? The truth of the matter is that we are the redeemed of the Lord. The truth of the matter is I'm the blessed seed of Abraham not trying to get blessed. I don't have to use my faith trying to get God to bless me. I don't try to claim the blessings or try to get God to do it. I'm blessed. Well, that's arrogant. Oh, no. I'm blessed when I ain't got a dime. I'm blessed when I don't have a home. I'm blessed if I got a car, but I ain't got a car. It ain't been long ago since I didn't even have a car. I'm still blessed. 
Why? Because the blessings is not measured in material things. I'm blessed anyway, but material things come and go. I'm still blessed. I don't look at somebody's car and call them blessed. I want to see what's inside of their heart to see if they're blessed or not. Because you can drive a brand new limo and have diamonds on every, on every ring of your fingers. <laughs> but the truth of the matter, that don't make you blessed. I tell you where you're blessed, when God calls you blessed. When God, everything you touch, God blesses it. When circumstances come, God works it out. When the devil comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord raises up a standard. Whatever happens, I don't care what it is, you always overcome and triumph in Christ Jesus. That's being blessed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, if I'm healed. Why am I hurt? If I'm healed, why have I got this knot? Why have I got this pain? Why have I got this symptoms? Let's go to Matthew 13. Matthew 13. We'll talk about that tonight. Matthew 13. Matthew 13. Now we know that uh, starting with 18, he's talking about the sower sowing the, sowing the seed. And then he talks about the 19, it's when, the, when one heareth the word of the what? The kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart, this is he which receiveth seed by the wayside. This is what I was sharing earlier. Sister Mary Lou, Brother Ray was talking to us, said, you know, when we first started hearing you minister, I didn't understand. I really could not really see all the stuff and understand spiritually what you were talking about. But you know what she said? Because we stayed in here, kept listening to the word, praying for understanding and enlightenment, you know, what God did is bring the revelation to them, and boy, you can tell they got the revelation of the Word now. Isn't that right? But you know what? If she had been one, like some people, and listened to the Word, and the Word being taught and ministered and sown, it's sown in people's hearts, but then they get up and they walk out and say, you know what, I just don't understand that. I don't understand that. Guess what? There's a devil out there, an adversary, and he listened for you to say that so he can come and steal that word out of your heart because you didn't understand it. Do you understand how that you turn your TV on and receive, and it, you know, this illustration is real simple, but you can receive pictures coming from Springfield or, or, or Little Rock? Can you understand that? Can you explain that to me? I don't have to understand it, and you don't have to explain it. You know what? I can turn it on and watch the picture and listen to the pro watch the program and listen to listen to what they're saying a long time before I ever understand it. I don't understand it, but I know it works. <laughs> Isn't that right? This is what the Word of God is saying here. When we hear the gospel of the kingdom or the gospel of authority, the gospel of redemption, the gospel of Jesus Christ being the ruler and the king of kings, and Lord of all, when we first start hearing this, then there's something inside, well, that don't go with what I've been taught. And you know what? When we say that and we walk out and say, I don't understand that preacher, the enemy comes and what does he do? He steals that word. I know if he steals the word, that ain't going to never come up in your life. Isn't that right? But you know what? If you just hang in there and keep on listening, well, I tell you, Brother Ray, Ray ministered a tremendous message Wednesday night on hearing. Hearing. Take heed what you hear and take heed how you hear. And you know, it's very important that when the word goes forth, how we hear what we hear. If we're sitting there listening and thinking we already know it all and I've already got it down pat and I understand what I understand, I'm not going to receive anything else. Guess what? You're not listening with a listening ear. And I'll be honest with you, when someone thinks that they know it, they don't know nothing as they ought, including all of us. Amen, Brother Ron. 
When we become unteachable and think we already know it, we've reached our end of where we're going. But when we can hear the Word of God and not understand it, but keep on standing there and let the Lord water that Word, and the Word comes just like faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing what? By hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing the Word. Did you believe the first time you ever heard ever Scripture? You just believed it just like that, right? No. How did we start believing? It's when the Word kept coming, kept coming, kept coming. And you know, the, the teaching or the ministry of the Word planted that Word, and the first thing you know, that Word started spouting and bringing forth the fruit of itself. Isn't that right? But if we reject the Word and reject it and reject it and reject it, you know what the devil comes? He just comes and steals it and leaves you just like you are. Look at your neighbor and say, God led you like you are. Some of you scared to say that because you know where I'm going, don't you? Now tell them, tell them, say, God led you too much to leave you like you are. What God is doing, his word changes us. We talked about this morning, the development stage of childhood, all the way up to maturity. Those things which are in part are done away with as we grow in God. I put away my tricycle, spiritually. Isn't that right? But as we hear more word and hear more word, and you know, that's how we grow naturally. We don't grow naturally by going to our Father and asking our Father to put his hand on my head and make me a man. Do we? We cannot grow into maturity by somebody just telling us and telling us and telling us and telling us. We have to take the knowledge that we receive, and I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, but how many know it's not just an instantaneous thing? Walking in redemption and living in what's rightfully ours and we're heirs of does not come because I hear it one time and I believe it. I mean, oh, the devil come and try to steal that word of redemption, but if I keep on and I embrace that, I know it's the truth. I mean, the devil ain't going to steal this. God's word is true. I don't care what the devil says. You know what? As I embrace that, I mean, oh, I become enlightened to that. Look at the neighbor and say, don't let the devil steal the word. If you don't understand it, don't let him steal the word. Just keep coming and letting God minister to it. But then in verse 20, but he that receiveth the seed into stony ground, the same as he that heareth the word, and an none with joy receiveth it, yet hath he not root in himself, but doeth for a while. For when tribulation and per or persecution ariseth, how or why? Because of the word, by and by, he is what? Offended. So just because we go past that non-understanding and we start receiving it, and it starts getting down inside of us does not mean that it's all over with then and we got it made. What the devil does or what the enemy does, now, he is not part of my life. He's outside of me. He used to live in me. He ain't in me no more. He's outside. And the only thing he can do now is try to get to me from the outside. But if we know who we are and we know the authority that we have and we know the Word of God, He can't do anything. Amen, Brother Ron. But when the Word comes and then persecution comes for the Word's sake or tribulation, what is tribulation? It's hardships, trials, troubles, comes for what reason? The Word's sake. When the Word of God comes, the enemy is going to come, you can mark it down, and try his best to give you evidence in the natural that what God's Word says is not true, to make you doubt the Word. Let me say this just plain and simple in Arkansas language. What the devil is going to do when you hear the gospel of redemption, he's going to come with circumstances that's going to be opposite of what you heard in order to make you think what you hear and it's not true and it don't work for me. It works for everybody else, but it don't work for me. So therefore, I'm on trial here. I can be on trial or the devil is putting the word on trial. I can take it as a personal attack of the devil or I can say, you know what? He's coming for the word's sake. He's coming to see if I really and truly know the word and stick my, I'm talking about my confidence and my trust in the word of God. And so therefore, it's up to me where I stand on the word regardless of what the circumstance. Have we ever thought about when God told Moses to go down and tell the children of Israel? to come out and he's going to deliver them and bring them into a land for them with milk and honey. And boy, I'm telling you, when you get over there, it's going to be wonderful there. But then the next thing that they got after God delivered them was not a land for them with milk and honey, 
they got sand dunes with no water. It was not a fruitful land. It was a desolate place. God lied. Moses lied to us what it is. I mean, he promised us a land full of milk. But this is the opposite of that. Now, isn't it amazing in the Scriptures how that that's not such an odd thing? All the way through the Scriptures is the same identical thing. God promises something, and the evidence, is, the natural evidence is opposite of what God promised. Why is that? Why does God allow that? He wants you to take God's Word above what the circumstances, this opposite of that Word, is telling us. Amen, Brother Ron. So when David was anointed to be king, he just went right up there and got on the throne and kicked Saul off, right? No, he ran for his life. <laughs> he hid in caves. When Abraham was promised a son, I'm going to bless you with a son. You and Saber are going to have a seed, and I'm going to bless you and bless your seed, and you're going to inherit the earth. Guess what? Abraham didn't even get to inherit a plot of ground except where he was buried. I'm talking about to possess it. Well, God lied. No, he didn't. The circumstances were the opposite of what God said. But you know what? Abraham staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief of the circumstances and situation. It didn't matter to him what the circumstances were. He didn't look in the mirror and say, Boy, man, you're getting ugly and old. He didn't say, Sarah, you are an ugly thing. He didn't even consider it. Saints of God, what God is bringing us into right now is we are the redeemed of the Lord right now. Jesus has already come. He has already redeemed us. He has borne all the curse in his own body. He bore it on his back. And guess what? I am healed right now where I feel like it, look like it. The doctor say, I don't care. It's what the Word says. You know what we have to do? Not even consider the natural. Well, how in the world can you say that? Because God says, that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And you know what? When I'm believing what God's Word says, I don't have to see anything. I love that song Brother Greg sang last weekend. I don't have to have any proof. I believe anyway. I don't need any evidence. I was talking about this morning. You know, some people walk up and want you to pray for them, and if you give them a miracle, then they'll believe you got Christ in you. But you know what? That don't bother me a bit. If nobody ever gets healed one time through me laying on a hand, I know Christ is still living on the inside of me. I know I'm a child of God. I know that he is my Savior. I know he's anointing me. I know that whenever he wants to, he can heal the sick through me. And you know what? It don't bother me that he don't do it every time I do it. Oh, my God. What's wrong with me? Nothing. I can't make a miracle happen. You can't either. But you know what? I, we don't consider you don't consider. Abraham didn't consider his old age. He didn't consider the deadness of Sarah's womb. He didn't consider the circumstance. Was it there? Yes. Well, he didn't consider it. Now, what does consider it mean? Come on now. What does consider it mean? He didn't consider it. Therefore, he didn't pay any attention to it. Is it there? Yes. Is Sarah old and ugly? Yeah. Or old and pretty? Yeah. Is Abraham old and ugly? Yeah. Is he past the prime of life? Yeah. Has Abraham been healed of her womb? No. Same old, same old. Been going on for years and years. Years and years. Same thing. But you know what? Abraham didn't even consider it. And you know what God is doing? We're the children of Abraham. <laughs> I said, we're the children of Abraham. You know what that means? I am of the seed of Abraham. And you know what? When I'm a seed of Abraham, it don't matter how old and ugly I get. I read you, didn't I? <laughs> you didn't think I picked that up, did you? <laughs> it, uh, I know Brother Doyle's getting over the hill tomorrow. He's going to be 60 years old. 60. Let's all gather around and pray for him that he'll make it. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, it does not matter. 
I tell you what, I've been hearing about the sons of God and the manifest of the sons of God and coming into the Jesus ministry and, and all this kind of stuff for years and years and years. What difference does it make? If you've heard it for five years, two years, or 40 years, or 50 years, it does not make any difference what God's Word says. It's going to be exactly like He says. I don't care what I look like. I may be walking around one of these days wrinkled, and you, I look like a prune, but it don't make no difference. God is not looking for a young spouse. He's looking for yielded vessel that will yield himself and let him manifest himself through them. Amen. Don't matter. Well, you're getting over the hill. Well, how old was Smith Wigglesworth when God visited that old plumber? And everybody, I mean, all the history said that he was ugly as I am. And he was ugly as a mud fence, they said. Big old brood of a guy and had nothing that nobody would have, you know, would have to anybody. But you know what? God wasn't looking for Hollywood stars. He was looking for yielded vessels. That's all God's looking for now is someone to believe his word, stand on it, regardless of what it is. God has not promised us an instant miracle every time we pray. I believe in miracles. So does God. But one thing God has not promised us is an instant miracle every time we pray for somebody. And then we get discouraged and disheartened because it didn't happen. Duh. Go ahead and say, duh. <laughs> God hadn't promised us an instant miracle. He said, lay hands on the sick and they'll get an instant miracle. What did he say? They said, what? Oh, I don't like that kind of gospel, that recovering stuff. I believe Jesus is able to make an instant miracle. Why, do, why, don't God, why doesn't God just absolutely give people a miracle when you pray for them? Can he heal them instantly? Well, let me ask you this. Why didn't God heal Sarah's womb instantly? And why didn't he give Abraham a seed and then go and have that child the next year? Was that too hard for God? Well, why didn't he go and do it? Didn't he promise him he'd go and do it? Didn't he tell him that Sarah was going to conceive and have a son? Well, why didn't God do it? Couldn't he do it? Well, why in the world did he wait? He wanted Abraham to to trust what God said more than he trusted the natural realm. He waited in order for Abraham to know that my word is faithful, my word is true. I don't care if you're 550. Don't change my word. I want you to know, Abraham, just because I don't do it instantly does not mean that I'm not going to do what I said I was going to do. So what do you do, Abraham? You embrace the Word, stand on it, praise God, magnify God, thank God for it, and believe it in your heart and confess it with your mouth. And it is unto salvation and deliverance and healing or whatever else. So what do we do? In a trial, we start this waffling stuff. I never heard that until a few years ago. What was that judge's name? Judge Wapner? Two ladies on there, they're talking about waffling back and forth. You know what God calls that? Double-mindedness. Believing it one minute, because God's word, nah, God, God's word is true. I mean, by his stripes, I'm already healed. I'm the redeemed of the Lord, now say so. And then we go outside, and this coming week, uh, <laughs> that heart is talk, y'all pray for me, I'm coming down with the flu. Well, wait a minute. Are you coming down with the flu, or are you the redeemed of the Lord? Are you catching cancer? Or are you already caught a healing? I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> Which one are you going to do? Because here you are, believing the Word of God, shouting about the Word, receive it with joy, and anon, man, you rejoice over it. Then this coming week, the symptoms hit you. <laughs> Aching in the fever. Burns on the head to foot. I think I'm coming down. Well, now you believe you're coming down with the flu. Sunday you believe you're redeemed of the Lord. So let them that is double-minded not think we will receive how much? Well, I don't know why in the world the Lord, Lord don't go on and heal me. Well, if I'm the redeemed of the Lord, why don't he just heal me? The Lord's checking you out. 
He's seeing if you're going to waffle back and forth. He's, going, he's seeing if the devil throws a little symptom on you. Are you going to start agreeing with him? Or are you going to stand on the word over here? Anybody out there tonight? I know this is not for any of y'all. I know y'all don't need it. I'm preaching to Ron Thomas tonight, okay? But it's the truth. Well, what if you got some bills coming up? What, you, what if you got some finances that you can't meet? What if, you know, the, the, your bank account's kind of low and banks notified that you'd better get some money in the mail, I mean in the bank? I know none of y'all have ever faced that problem. I have. What are we going to do now? Well, by God, darling, what in the world are we going to do? Same thing we've always done. What's that? Stand on the Word of God. Like Brother Hagin always told us in Rama at school, he said, just act like the Word of God's true. Just act like it is. If you don't know it is or not, go and act like it is. And by you acting like it is, you'll find out it really is. Just live just like God's Word can't lie. By the way, he went on to be with the Lord last Friday morning at 7 o'clock. Not this past Friday, but Friday was a week ago. And uh, we was in school with him, and he always told us, I think I'll live to be about 100. But then when he got on about 80 years old, he started saying, you know what? I'm going to live until I'm satisfied with life. Then he started saying, I don't know if I want to live to be 100. But you know what he always said, and he always quoted it, and I believe it with all of my heart. He said, Psalms 91 says that the Lord will satisfy me with long life. So he's going to leave me here till I'm satisfied. When I'm satisfied, I'll go to sleep with my father and go and be with the Lord. Guess what happened? 86 years old, sitting there eating breakfast with his wife, Aretha, that Sunday morning, and sitting there and he looked at, eating his breakfast, looked up at, from the... From his food, looked up at her and smiled real big. And just heart stopped. <laughs> no heart attack, you know, all this disease. Stuff. No, he just went to be with the Lord. You know what Aretha did? Of course, she done like all, most of us would do. Man, she grabbed the phone, called 911. They came out there and, you know, and got him back and got him breathing again, stuck a tube down his throat. They kept his body breathing from then to the next Friday. But you know what? He's already gone to glory. And the reason I'm saying that is, is I believe with all of my heart, thanks of God, if the Word says it, let's believe it. And if we believe it, then live like it. And if we live like it, we'll find out it really is true. But if I start doubting it, and I don't really know if it is or not, like we're talking about stepping out of the boat, you know, we, we preached about uh, dry boat fitters and wet water walkers about three weeks ago. You know, we, we start to get out of the boat, you know, where the waves are, and we start doing this, patting the water, see if it's going to hold us up before we get out. And though it ain't the water that's going to hold you up, what's going to hold you up? The Word is going to hold you up. Faith in that Word is what holds us up. Isn't that right? But you know what? Closing with this headed that way, <laughs> slowing down for the finish line. <laughs> That's right. I tell y'all all the time, I'm like a freight train. I'm slow about getting started, but once you better get on while I'm going slow, because once we get going, you can't get on. Well, I can't stop it on time either. <laughs> well, that's good. Thank you. I needed that. <laughs> What was I saying? <laughs> Let's all stand and go home. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, we talked about this, and we, sh you know, th this is the gospel that the Lord has given us, and that is the fact that the Old Testament was prophesying of a Redeemer. The four gospel says the Redeemer's come. He's here right now. Then the epistles says that he's already come. He's already done what he said he's going to do. Now we're the redeemed of the Lord, and now we say so. Promises have to have faith. Promises produce faith and hope in our lives. Is that right? And when you hear the promise, with faith, you embrace that promise when you don't see any evidence of it whatsoever. Is that right? But then not only do you have to have faith, but the Bible says you have to have patience with your faith. 
waiting for God to fulfill the promise. Is that what the Word says? Faith and patience, we inherit the promise. Isn't that right? That's something that a lot of people leave out, leave out is that patient stuff when it comes to promises. All right, we're going somewhere. Hold on just a little bit. That is the fact that what we're talking about and what we talked about last weekend, that is the fact that we're not waiting for promises anymore. The promises have been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. We're not promised a Redeemer. He's already come. It's already, he's already been here, done it, and gone. You don't have to have faith for something that's already been fulfilled. Just like we used this illustration last week. Brother Doyle told me he was going to be here today. Just say, for instance, Brother Doyle told me he was going to be here today. Well, I had to believe what he said and expect him to be here before I ever saw him show up. But now he's here. I'm looking at him. Do I need faith to believe he's going to be here? What do I need now? I'm, it's a fact that he's here. The promise is fulfilled, and now the promise has become a what? A fact. Now, in, it's a fact. Now I don't need faith to believe that. Now I believe that, that he's here. Isn't that right? I don't have faith to believe that Jesus is coming. I don't have to have faith to believe he's going to redeem me. I don't have to have faith to believe he's going to heal me. Now I need to believe that he's healed me. Already past tense. I said it's past tense. Well, let's go back to what we're talking about to start with because this is, this is the nugget, or this is the, the crux of the message tonight, and that is the fact that if my healing is a fact, and it is, it's finished fact, it's not a promise. What, what is happening to the church today, we're taking facts and we're using them as promises. Promise of the Redeemer coming and bearing the stripes for our healing was in Isaiah 53. The fact was when Jesus came, he bore the stripes on his back and now we are already healed. Is that a fact? But how do I take that that's a fact and it affect my life? That's what we want to really know is how do I take what is a fact that Jesus came, he's already died, he already bore the stripes for my healing, and so therefore I am already healed. So if I'm believing the Lord to come and heal me, I'm taking the fact and trying to make it a promise. Are y'all following that? It's not a promise anymore. Healing is not a promise to us anymore. Healing is not a promise. God didn't promise to heal you. He already said that he has already healed you. Now the promise has become a fact. You don't have faith for it anymore. You believe it. And when you believe it, it's a fact. Knowledge of the fact causes you to be a believer. And when you're a believer and you know this in your heart and you're a believer, then therefore when you start believing, then you start saying, I know that. It's the step. We don't know that it's a fact until we hear the gospel preached to us. We don't preach the gospel as a promise anymore. We preach the gospel as good news. You know what good news is? That's something that's already happened. Isn't that right? Good news is reporting of something good that has happened. The gospel means good news or heralding the good news. The good news is that Jesus has already come and he's already redeemed us and we're already healed. Is that good news? Well, it ain't good news if I don't, you know. No, it's only good news to them that receive it as good news. <laughs> but when I receive it as good news, then I realize it is the fact that Jesus came. Then when it's a fact, then I believe that. Now, since I believe that, then the next step is, is I know that. And it's when I know that that I know that it's going to, I mean, that, it's it, that it is. Well, what about all these symptoms? Don't consider. I'm healed anyway. Well, what if you're aching? I'm healed anyway. Don't consider it. Well, I ain't going to say I'm healed when I ain't. Then you ain't. And you won't ever be. Because you're taking what is a fact and you're trying to put it as a promise. You're trying to believe God for a promise of, of healing you. And he ain't going to give you healing. It's already there. It's already there. You know what we do? We run around looking for somebody to lay hands on us and give us healing. Proverbs. I told you I was slowing down. Proverbs chapter 3. 
Proverbs chapter 3. Because if you're double-minded, you don't get anything from God. Well, that leaves me out because I'm double-minded. You know what a double-minded person needs? The only thing they need is more truth to persuade them of the truth. If I'm double-minded back and forth, I'm living by my soul feelings one minute and living by what the Scripture and the Spirit says the next. What I need is more anchoring in what God says. Anchor my soul in the truth. And if I really and truly get in the truth and know the truth and believe the truth and know the truth, then you know what? The truth supersedes these evidence of things over here. This lies against the truth of God's Word. The Bible says, Mightily grew the Word of God and the Word prevailed. Isn't that right? He says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not unto your what? Your own understanding over here. What is your understanding? Well, I'm hurting. I got symptoms. The doctor said this. The doctor said that. This is this other stuff that my understanding is telling me. I'm telling you something. If you got symptoms and you're going to the doctor to get him to absolutely confirm that you got a disease, you'll probably get it. Well, let me say that again. <laughs> if you've got symptoms and you go to the doctor, are you against doctors? Absolutely not. They will confirm what you're believing one way or the other. If you, th if you believe you've got cancer, the Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart. But if you believe you're healed and redeemed of the Lord, then guess what? You're going to go to the doctor and the doctor ain't going to find nothing. But don't get mad at the doctor when he can't find anything because you're redeemed and then go to another doctor and keep going to the doctor until finally somebody confirms to you that you got it. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not what? Your own understanding in all thy ways. Acknowledge him in what? He shall direct your paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes, but what? Re reverence the Lord or fear the Lord and depart from evil. And it shall be what? Health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. And in the margin of my Bible, it says, it shall be what? Medicine to thy navel or thy nerves and thy sinews, and marrow to thy bones, which is moisture to the bones. So the Word of God, and trusting in the Word of God with all of my heart, it is medicine to all my flesh. Go here to chapter 5, last scripture, chapter 5, verse 20. My son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Let them... Keep them in the midst of thy heart, for they are what? Life unto those that find them, and what? Health to all their flesh. Y'all got it? Proverbs 4. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I said 5. Proverbs 4 and 20. I was wondering why y'all wasn't helping me preach. 4 and 20. My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear to my sayings, or my word. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Believe in his word with all your heart. For they are life unto those that find them, and they are health to what? All their, all their flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And put away from thee a forward mouth, and perverse lips put far from thee. So what we're seeing right here, it also says in 22 that his word is life unto those that find him and health or medicine to all their flesh. Listen carefully and I'm closing. God's word is medicine. It says that he says that I'm the Lord that healeth thee. He didn't say I'm the Lord that gives you a miracle every time. I'm the Lord that what? Healeth, healeth thee. Sometimes it's instant healing. Sometimes it's gradual healing. Sometimes it's quicker than others. But see, that's not on our part. That's on his part. I cannot believe God for a miracle every time I pray. I just believe he's going to do what he says, and he's going to do it whichever way he says it. But I don't stagger because it don't come the way I believe for it. This is important because I've seen so many Christians, when you minister to them, walk off because they didn't instantly get a miracle. And, well, I didn't get nothing. I'm still sick. Come on, help me. Duh. 
God didn't promise you that any time anybody laid hands on you, he's going to get an instant miracle. So therefore, don't cast away your confidence. It has a great recompense and reward. What did he say? He said his word is medicine to all your flesh. He sent his word and he healed them. And on top of that, thanks of God, how many of us, it's not quoting scriptures that brings healing to me. We want to get, we want to be attacked while we're being attacked, I should say, of, of some kind of pain or the symptoms of a sickness or whatever. Then we jump up and start quoting scriptures and, and expect God to back up his scriptures. That is not what God said. Let me say that again. God did not say, I will back up my scriptures. He said, if you believe in your heart, when you believe his word in your heart and you speak his word because you believe it out of your mouth, then it is healing and he will do what he says he'll do. Quoting scriptures don't do anything unless you believe it in your heart. I've seen people trying their best to cast out devils been in the service they're trying to cast out devils i wasn't a part of that they're just trying to cast out devils they worked for an hour and a half trying to get the devil out of this person and so finally a guy took the bible opened it up and where it says you know in luke 10 where i give you authority over all the powers of the enemy nothing about shall by any means hurt you open that bible up that scripture and said devil i want you to read this and laid it on top of that man's chest i thought give me a break the devil is going to read that scripture now inside of that man and then leave. Go ahead. Duh. <laughs> God ain't promised that. I tell you what the devil reads, and that is when it's written in your heart and you say it with your mouth because you know it's the truth. I tell you what, the devil knows if you believe God's word or not, and he don't answer anything else. But when you say what the word says and you know what the word says, he will flee from you when you do that. The word, when we believe it with our hearts, plant it in our hearts, embrace it inside, know it's the truth, know it's the fact, know what God's word says, and believe it and become, I know that. I, mean, I, I like that old saying, it's a no-so salvation. No-so salvation. How I many know healing has to be a no-so healing? Not, I hope it does. Maybe it will. I'm going to get them to pray. Probably nothing happens. No, you probably ain't going to get nothing. Come on, unless God just absolutely has pity on you. Amen, Brother Lauren. But what is it? His word, when it's believed, it is life. It is life to all of my body. It's life unto my life in every area. It brings life. The spirit of the law of life in Christ Jesus. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus makes me free from all the laws of sin and death. The word. Then you turn right around. He says it's medicine to all of our flesh. But you know what? If you don't believe, when you go to the doctor and he gives you a prescription, you tell him the symptoms, he gives you a prescription, third closing, Go to your neighbor and say, third closing. What does that mean? Not much. <laughs> but when, what do you do with medicine? <laughs> what do you do with medicine? If his word is medicine to all of my flesh, does that mean that I take one scripture and I eat that and I'm instantly healed? No, he didn't say that it's, that, that the word of God is an instant miracle. He said it's medicine. It's healing to all of your flesh. It's health. What does that mean, Brother Ron? It means is that as I know the word of God and I know that it's the truth and I know it's a fact and I keep on believing that and anchoring, I'm not observing these lying vanities over here. I'm not waffling back and forth. I'm not this way to, today and then double-minded tomorrow. I stand on the word of God and then you know what I do? I apply the word to my life every day. I don't get up and read scriptures every day and try to quote this scripture and try to believe it. No, the word is in my heart. Do I read scriptures every day? No. Don't read the Bible every day. No, I got something greater than reading the letter of the word every day, and it's the living word. Do you read, read the letter? Oh, yes. 
But I tell you something, the living word is what's on the inside that takes the word there and quickens it and makes it alive to me. The living word. The rhema word. The living spoken word. The life of the word of God. Not the letter, but it's the life of the living word. You know what? As I apply that to my life, you know what? I'm the redeemed of the Lord. Do you know he's bore every curse in his own body? My sins in his own body? Do you know he bore every sickness and every disease in his own body? He already bore that. He bore all my pains, all my sorrows, and all this. You know what? And by his stripes, I'm already healed. And do you know I know that to be the truth? And I tell my flesh that every day. I tell my body that every day. I tell the devil that every day. You know what I'm doing? I'm taking medicine taking medicine. You know what that medicine will do? It'll bring healing to me. But you know what? If I got perverse lips, and I'm talking about Jesus healing me one day, and then I'm coming down with cancer the next, that's perverseness. It's perversion. Don't let that man think you'll get anything from God, because he won't. I can't be redeemed and sick at the same time. I can be redeemed and attacked with sickness at the same time. But just because I'm attacked with... Just like Brother Hagin said. Brother Hagin said, I'll tell you what, said I hadn't been sick in 50 years. And that was back in, in, in 1992, he said that. 90, 91, 92. He said, I hadn't been sick in 50 years. I hadn't took an aspirin nothing in 50 years. I hadn't been sick in 50 years. My Lord, I couldn't say that. I didn't think I could ever say that. But you know what? I thank the Lord that he went and come back with this other. He said, you know what? It's not that I hadn't had many opportunities. He said, I've had a bunch of opportunities to get sick. He said, I've been attacked a bunch of times. He said, I just wouldn't receive it. Anybody out there? So are you going to keep getting sick for 20 years? Or are, you just gonna, or are we going to stand our ground and say, I'm the redeemed of the Lord. I ain't been sick in years and I ain't fixing to be sick. Why? It doesn't mean that I might not be attacked with sickness, but I ain't got to accept it and take it and believe it and confess that rather than the Word of God. <laughs> what do you do with medicine? You read the prescription and you read the instructions. <laughs> you read what it says. If it says take two pills daily before meals or after a meal, don't take them before meals because you're probably going to make you sick. Anybody out there? If it says take it three times a day, I'm going to be honest with you. If you don't believe the medicine's going to do you one drop of good, you just wasted your money. Because it ain't the medicine. The medicine without faith is worthless to you. If it helps you, it's going to be an accident. That's the truth. But if you really believe, the doctor says, if you take this, that'll be gone in 10 days. You know what? If you believe what he says, you're going to take that for 10 days and expecting it to be gone in 10 days. Isn't that right? But you know what? You can't take it today and then take it tomorrow. This mess ain't working. I don't feel no better today than I did the day before yesterday. When I started taking it, I quit. Guess what? It ain't going to help you none. You have to take it not for five days and quit. I know the Word of God is medicine and it is healing to all of our flesh, but we can't believe it for two days and then throw in the towel and quit. They go to the neighbor and say, I'm redeemed. And I'm taking medicine. I take God's word. And as I apply God's word to my life every day, I'm the redeemed of the Lord and I say so. Doesn't matter what the devil says. It doesn't matter what the symptoms are. Don't consider it. Look at your neighbor and say, don't consider it. Do you believe that Abraham would have got the promise if he had started considering his own body? You believe that, that Sarah, that, he, that they would have had that son if he started considering that Sarah's womb was dead and, you know, she's too old and all this? No, it was faith. Knowing what God had promised that he would do. Stand to your feet if you will.